on the way in. Mark Riley, BBC Six Music. And teardrop, Mark Riley over here, over there. We've got Bob Hughes. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm all right. I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a bit of class starting off there, Bob. Good work. Oh, it's wonderful, that. It really is. And, and I'm feeling very cosy tonight because uh, not only have I got the big light on and lots of um, pieces of sponge surrounding me, but I've got my new door sausage there, just stopping stopping the extra chill coming well, through the door. you've got money, you've got to spend it somewhere, haven't you, mate? <laughs> you have, mate, yeah. Uh, so look at the enemy here, 14th of November, 1998. And in the news, it says, Massive attack of denied reports there to split. The, bland, uh, the band said stories circulating they were about to disband had started after they played a practical joke on a reporter. They said they were just sick of journalists asking about their depressing album, Mezzanine, so they decided to have fun by pretending the LP had made them so miserable they couldn't stand to be together anymore. Right. Uh, th- this resulted in press reports saying the trio had rowed and were to split to concentrate on solo projects. Uh, Robert Del Naja, aka 3D, said, We were at this award show, everybody was asking the same questions about how dark the album was, so we just said, well, that's because we don't get along. Uh, someone took it seriously and thought that meant it was the end, so we went along with it just for a laugh. And he added that uh, the a band had received a number of worried calls from their management and also their mums and dads. Right, I mean, I was the plugger for Massive Attack for a short while, for Blue oh, yeah. Lines, which is one of the mm. great albums. Oh, yeah. And I did do one promo tour with them, and I've never worked with a band who wanted to be anywhere else but doing a promo tour in their lives. <laughs> and, <laughs> really? And I, I don't blame them, you know. I mean, they just say they weren't that bothered about doing it. They'd just done what they wanted to do, which was a record, and they wanted to put it out, but the record company said, Circa. They said, mm. no, you've got to go out and promote it. It's just the way of the world. <laughs> and so they, there was about eight of them out on the road, you know, um, mm. in, in a transit van just flitting around following me in a car. And they, was, <laughs> they weren't happy. And I really no. don't blame them for that at all. Yeah, always got that impression. Uh, also in the news, Portishead, Lou Reed, Slade, Robin Hitchcock and Metallica are among the stars of The Enemy at the NFT On The Road film series. So the National Film Theatre showing uh, films across cinemas from the UK from December until February. Films included are the, uh, is the touring festival include Portishead, P- PYNC, which documents their performance at New York's Roseland Ballroom. Modulations, which features over 60 artists in Lara Lee's history of 20th century electronic music. And there's also also a new film, Lou Reed, Rock and Roll Heart, the first documentary on Reed examining his career from Andy Warhol's factory through the 70s to the present day. This is, um, uh, I know that there's a lot of famous people on there, like, you know, uh, contributing, like David Bowie's on there, David Byrne, Eno, Thurston Moore, Patti Smith, loads of them. And they all do that thing where, um, famously, Andy Warhol used to do screen tests in the, in the factory where you just, stare, basically, you just try and stare out a camera. Yeah. And they're all doing that, and none of them can keep a straight face. It's just one of those, but some of them keep it up longer than others. And you know what? I don't think I've seen that documentary, and you would think I would have been, you know... A Absolutely, yeah. Music. yeah. Yeah, see it. Uh, also, two films not shown during the enemy at the NFT season. These are the just-released storefront Hitchcock, a new Jonathan Demme film of Robin Hitchcock's two shows in a vacant storefront in New York earlier this year, and Slade in Flame, a fictional 1974 account of the rise and fall of a teeny bot band starring the loon-panted Slade, which we know all about, don't we? I was reading today, now that Dave Hill um, was shocked at the premiere because when he got the script, he only read uh, the lines that applied to his character, Barry. And so when he, saw, when he saw the film in all its glory, he couldn't quite believe it. So he didn't know what was coming next, then? Oh, he had no idea. <laughs> right, <not laughs> okay. all. Well, I mean, it is one of the great music films, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. No doubt about that. Uh, and Pet Shop Boys, uh, Dub Pistols, Add N2X and Boy George have joined forces with artists including Tracy Emin, Jake Chapman and Gilbert and George for We Love You, a book and CD out later this month. The avant-garde collection includes An- Add N2X teaming up with elephant dung painter Chris Ophilly for a track called The Fullness That Fills Up The Pulse Of Durations Is Full. And Tracy Emin and Boy George doing a song called Burning Up. Uh, the album is described as an unusual fusion of visuals and music and was compiled to combine some of the most provocative and experimental artists like like-minded musicians, it says here. I'm not fam- familiar with it, but it does lead on to this because um, David Stubbs, who had a column called Banging On in Enemy at this point, is talking about the fact that uh, very recently Jeffrey Archer had sold all his Andy Warhol collection of art for a phenomenal sum. Right, I've never heard about that. that. 
on the fact that Alexander McQueen's D- Damon Hurst are household names. So he says, uh, okay, uh, the more outrageous and avant-garde their work, the more column inches of attention they command, the higher their prices. But here's my question. How come none of this applies to the avant-garde in the music world? As somebody who over the years has championed the commercially hopeless musical causes of people like Faust, Le Bradford and Suicide, it pains me that whereas in the world of art and design, extremism is highly lucrative. In the world of music, it means playing upstairs at the garage to 250 people on a Sunday night. It's a fair point, but I mean, at the same, uh, same point in time, if you consider if Suicide just released one copy of the debut album, then it probably would have ended up, you know, Sarchi and Sarchi and in some kind of museum being donated somewhere. But as it stands, you know, it's that old joke, isn't it, really? Of, you know, it's a limited release, limited to how mm. many people want to buy it. You know, exactly. and so, yeah. 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 But yeah. I, I understand what I, he means, though. Here's his point. Apparently, the, you know, CDs are all priced the same. So he goes on to make the point that really CDs should be priced depending on the uh, quality of the product. So he suggests, for example, that Astral Week should be sold for £358.99, mm. Lighthouse Family for £13, that kind of thing. Well, yeah, that's a cheap shot. I mean, we, and we, me and Radcliffe did plenty of those, to be honest. But, <laughs> but at the same time, I'd have to take him to task on Astral Weeks anyway. I'd put that down with £13 <laughs> myself, personally. Ooh, I don't I like that not. album at all. I know it's not one of your favourites at no. all, is it? But anyway, uh, quality will prevail, etc., etc. So, uh, Through the Trees is out, which is a Handsome Family album, and this track we're going to hear is uh, the first thing I ever heard. This is what made me fall in love with the Handsomes in the first place. OK, Weightless again. Handsome Family and Weightless Again, Mark Riley, Bob Hughes, Parallel Universe. Yeah, going to play that for Michael in Wales and also for Helen, who's poorly, and Niall, recovering from an op. Um, so look at the enemy here, 14th of November 1998. Various albums out this week, got The Levelers, Rizza, Ice Cube, uh, Jad Fair and Yola Tengo, Strange But True and Matador. Uh, a concept album built around a series of fake National Enquirer head, uh, headlines. Uh, recorded piecemeal between 1994 and 96. The songs on Strange But True are at their best gentle parables from a parallel alt-rock universe. So meet the Nevada man who invented a 21-key piano and the grocer sculpting Mount Rushmore from cheese. Uh, Jad and Yola Tengo understand the obscure forces that drive them all too well. And Stephen Dalton reviews... Uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, the film directed by Terry Gilliam. I have to admit, I haven't seen this. Have you? I have seen it, yeah, and I wasn't mad keen. I'm a right ah. grumpy git tonight, aren't I? To no, do you know what, mate? <laughs> you know, he, he kind of shares your view here. Right. Uh, it starts off by saying, Hunter S. Thompson's legendary un- unfilmable book finally struggles onto the big screen, leaving several directors and uh, aborted false starts in its wake. Was it worth the 27-year wait? Sort of, he says. Uh, Gilliam adapts the book faithfully, but somehow blunts Thompson's savagely intense prose with cartoonish visuals, uh, repainting the Baroque tackiness of early 70s Vegas in fantastic acid swirls the director constantly strains to frame his crazy paving vision in a socio-political context. Uh, Johnny Depp, meanwhile, turns Thompson into a kind of Groucho Marx with comically grunted quips and Benicio del Toro is little more than a caricature too, despite bloating himself out to raging bull dimensions to play the outside gonzo. Often Gilliam seems to be making a different film from his two stars. Is that how he... Your view? Well, it's a long time ago I saw it, but I did enjoy, and again, the jury's out on this one, so um, each to their own, would be Where the Buffalo Roam with Bill Murray. Have you seen that one? Yeah, I have. That's a long time ago since I saw it. Was that about 1980, was it? Something like that? Got to be something like that. But I did enjoy that. That made me laugh out loud on many occasions. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have um, been out and been for a meal with Ralph Steadman, uh, and ah. he was telling loads of great stories about his time with Hunter S. Thompson. Um, just, yeah, quite incredible. So, and he'd say hello to Kerry, Kerry Levy, our okay. mate, mutual friend. <laughs> Wonderful, OK. Uh, big feature here, Stephen Wells goes to meet the John Spencer Blues Explosion in Coney Island. Uh, drummer Russell Simmons, guitarist Judah Bauer and the shy, self-effacing top dog John Spencer. He says, the Blues Explosion are an acquired taste like anchovies, raw alcohol, olives, capers and paraffin wax candles. The blues bit is mostly nonsense. You'll find chugalug rockabilly drumming, prickly 60s soul guitar riffs in there and loads more besides. 
goes on, John, John Spencer goes on to explain it's the most stupid name I could think of. We just wanted to have a good time, and that was the first thing that came into my mind. Well, he's got the hit makers now, who, um, yes, oh. my album of the year, Spencer gets it lit. He's just still doing it, he's still uh, at the top of his game. Yeah, absolutely. Just brilliant. Uh, John Spencer continues. He said, you want artifice, you want attitude, and you want legends. He says, that's why we play rock and roll. There's a part of us that is really into the larger-than-life legend, Jerry Lee, Little Richard, etc. The art of control, crazy rock and roll character, the entertainment side of it. This is a very contemporary record. The new one is Acme. Uh, influenced by stuff from everywhere. It doesn't sound like Carl Perkins or Chuck Berry, but it tries to reflect the true spirit of rock and roll. And that was the thing, wasn't it? The same applies to the Jim Jones review. It's that idea of capturing that, that kind of raw elemental spirit rather than slavishly reproducing anything. Yeah, completely. I mean, we played Jim Jones tonight with the All-Stars and, uh, ah. yeah, yeah, I know what you mean exactly. Yeah, OK. Uh, to the indie charts, I think. OK, we're going to go to Silver Jews now? We are. OK, this is Smith & Jones Forever. Before we go any further, I need to say a big thank you, a heartfelt thank you, and send lots of love to Michelle Louise Chowdhury, who sat just over there. It's her last show of the year tonight. You're great. Thank you very much indeed. And also, I need to say thank you very much indeed to Mr. Bob Hughes for introducing me to Silver Jews, because as it transpires, we were um, we we're lucky enough to have Silver Jews perform on the last tour that they ever did of the UK. It came in and did it. So I got to meet David, and of course, he, he tragically passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but that was Smith & Jones Forever by Silver Jews. Mark Riley, Bob Hughes, Parallel Universe. Yeah, we'll look at The Enemy here, 14th of November, 1998. Gigs this week, you've got Massive Attack, heard them earlier at Bristol Anson Rooms, John Cale at the Royal Festival Hall, PJ Harvey at Manchester Academy, let's see, Osric Tentacles at the Astoria in London, Sebado at Oxford Zodiac, Pulp supported by Eels at Doncaster Dome. So Pulp back on the agenda next year, aren't they? They're uh, playing yeah. live gigs again. Yep. Shane McGowan and the Popes at the Forum in London, Cardiacs at the Garage in uh, Highbury, Cypress Hill at Glasgow Barrowlands, Dr. John at Warwick Arts Centre, Cat Power at the Madeira Hotel in Brighton, uh, Napalm Death at Glasgow Cat House, The Damned at Norwich Waterfront, Queens of the Stone, uh, Stone Age at Manchester Hop and Grape, Suicide at the Victoria Inn in Derby, and Ten Benson at Esquires in Bedford. Also, Johnny Vegas at Dublin Music Centre. I just mentioned this because I think it may have been around this time or maybe a year or so before this. I went to, We went to see Johnny Vegas at the Romley Forum in Stockport and it was absolutely one of the most hair-raising gigs I've ever seen because at that point he was doing um, his, the last minute of his show, you know, his great sort of finale. He would make a teapot in a minute, I think. Right. And, while, and while this was going on, he'd play some background music and he would make, he'd put the lights on in the whole theatre and uh, just get people to bring up certain blokes and make them dance while he was doing this sort of part and it was obviously one of those moments where you just kind of sink back in your seat and try to leave and anybody who was sort of trying to leave or get out the door was just immediately hauled back in it was just terrifying well i know there was one show that he did 